Right. Well, that was um, a great. That first podcast there was all about the sound itself. But let's talk about now the the, the engineering aspects of moving it from from a microphone. Here's one now to uh, to your receiver. Oh, here's one now. Oh, I've got so many. <laughs> so, so yeah. Phil, connectors and wires, please. <laughs> Yeah, so we talked a bit about it in the 101. We talked a bit about um, uh, audio, the nature of sound, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, vibrations in the air being turned into electrical variations down a cable by a microphone. And, of course, as facilities engineers, as people who work in TV studios and, and, and editing facilities and uh, those kind of places, um, you know, half our life is about, you know, moving uh, signals around buildings. You know, it's about getting the VTR into the air. It's about, you know, the audio booth being able to work with the um, audio suite two floors away. Um, you know, and, and if you work in radio, that's that's your whole world. You, you know, that's what you do all the time. Um, so from an engineering point of view, uh, you know, there's a few... Um, well-established standards uh, that uh, that we deal with all the time. Now, I've got up on screen uh, at the moment a uh, a pair of XLR connectors. Uh, they're they're you know ubiquitous throughout the industry. Uh, they're that, that you here we can uh, you can see the, the the lady connector and the gentleman connector, the the female and the male. And you know they're called that for obvious reasons. The male's got protuberances and and the, and the female's got holes. Um, there's kind You're of no, blushing. There's no You're better blushing. way. Yeah. <laughs> there's no better way of explaining it, really, is there? Um, the, the, a quick thing, which a lot of engineers forget, which is a really handy little sort of takeaway, is that in the case of audio, as with lots of other things, but audio particularly, uh, with XLRs, um, the pins dictate the direction of current flow if something's been wired and cabled correctly. So if you see an XLR male, you know a signal is coming out of that connector. If you see an XLR female that you know a signal has to go into that connector. So you look on the back of a VTR and we we'll look on the back of a, here's a here's a microphone. Spin that we'll microphone. Just turn it. Yep. There you go. And it's a, it's a male because they're the outputs. In fact, I've got here I've got a balancing box a uh, uh, and and you can see the the outputs of the balancing box there they are on male XLRs and the inputs of the balancing box there they are on on female XLRs. And that's okay. that's a standard that that is ubiquitous um you know and and uh, you you know you see if, if you ever go on outside broadcast, you see uh, OB boys often have uh, gender changes, male to male, female to female. And that's because they quite often use um, eight core, multi core cables um, interchangeably for inputs and outputs. So they'll break the cable out onto a panel with both males and females. They can use the tie lines to go to and from. Uh, so, so, kind of, we can forgive our OB brothers for that. But uh, generally speaking, that's a good standard to adhere to. That, that if you see pins, there's a signal coming out of it. If you see holes, the signals go into it. So, that's in the case of the XLR connector. The, the other thing that people often forget about the XLR, but it's really worth remembering, is that that, that, uh, that abbreviation XLR stands for screen line return, and that's the order of the pins. So oh, I didn't know that. If, if you're if you're wiring up an XLR connector, um, you see you see marked on this one here. There's a there's a, a number one indicating that's pin one. Let's see if we can zoom in on that a bit better. So that's pin one. So we know that is the screen. That's pin two because it goes one, two, three. Uh, pin pin two is always the line, the live, the red cable in a multi-core cable, and and pin three is the return, the the, the black cable. Um, so so XLRs are always wired that way. XLR screen line return one, two, three. Remember that, and you can't go wrong. Um, very very interesting, and um, that just flags a point that we might have. Uh, we, uh, we might cover oh yes we will certainly cover is balanced and unbalanced yes. audio which which uh which we need to just mention there. Yeah, absolutely. So, 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 having mentioned the XLR, it would be remiss not to then mention the B gauge jack or the PO jack, as they're sometimes called. And uh, there it is again. It's a balanced connector. It's but but in, in the case of this, it doesn't have. It's it's not an XLR connector. But 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 we've got the the, the hot the the the, uh, the line the, the 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 pin two on an XLR is the tip of this connector. The uh, the return the pin three of an XLR um, is the the black. Um, uh, core is is the ring, and then the screen, I pin one of the XLR is is the is the body of the connector, and it looks a bit like a quarter jack for a pair of headphones. It looks a bit like a, that's sometimes called an A gauge jack. It looks a bit like that. Yeah, they're a tiny bit different. They kind of fit into each other's holes. Although if you do it a lot, you risk breaking um, uh, the hole that you're pushing the wrong one into. And I think I think um, B gauge jacks will break quarter inch jack inputs. 
but the other way around, you just don't get a particularly good connection. Um, no, because if you look at the the, the tip, uh, it's smaller, isn't it? It's it's quite a lot smaller on the B. Yes, yeah, than, just, than the A. Just glancing around my desk to see if, I, if I've got a uh, an adapter, but I haven't. So I, can't, I can't whip one up and show you. Um, I'll just have a look and see if I've got one. But hold on one sec. You keep going. Yeah, for sure. So so so. Um, these are commonly used on patch panels. Uh, so, so, so there's an audio patch panel there, which just got popped up. And audio patch panels are very useful devices. Just, no, I didn't have one. Well, we're just onto the audio, yeah. audio patch panels here, and I've got, I've got a picture of a 24-way a source destination audio patch up on the screen. And you go into any facility. Oh, look, look. <laughs> you, don't, you don't, don't have to go to a facility. Go to Hugh's basement, and there it is. <laughs> yes, <clears throat> removed hastily. Yeah, dear me. Did the, Grim, the Grim Reaper came and took that one, did he? <laughs> yes, that's actually from... It is actually an old one from a, a recording studio, 24-track uh, recording studio. Um, is that one of the 24 tracks? That's not one of the 24 tracks, but uh, the, its sister has the 24-track uh, 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 stuff on it. But you, you, we can talk about things. You'll be able to see what's going on in there. And, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, so, so in the case of a facility... Um, it's very handy not to have to go behind the racks and and plug an XLR cable into the back of VTR1 and walk two racks down with your long cable and plug it into Avid 3 because that day Avid 3's been assigned VTR1 and, and that's what you need. It's very handy to be able to bring all the equipment in the facility up onto patch panels and, and, and then it's, it's trivial for the operator, for the assistant, to stand in front of the cabinet and push in little short length uh, patch cords and, and patch up what he needs. And uh, you see them everywhere. You see them in recording studios, yeah. radio studios, uh, television facilities everywhere. Uh, and, and the quarter inch, uh, sorry, the B gauge patch panel is, is ubiquitous. Now, uh, a very handy thing. So I've got a picture of a, a B gauge patch panel. If I pop up another picture, and it's at the inside of a back of a cabinet where there's probably a dozen patch panels, um, uh, you know, in that particular patch panel, in that particular cabinet. And, and you can see they're wired on multi core cables. And those multi-core cables, um, when you're building a facility, it would be very inconvenient to have to take every one of those cables in each multi-core cable to the piece of equipment that you determined when you designed the facility. Because what happens if two years later, and, you know, as we're going through at the moment, uh, material isn't arriving at our facility on videotape, but it's arriving uh, in a digital format. And you might say, well, I don't need all those VTR slots anymore, but I'd really quite like to reuse my jack fields uh, for some other purpose. Maybe maybe we've got in some other kind of equipment now that has audio outputs, but it's not a VTR, and it's not in that cabinet, it's in that cabinet over there. So, so it's, you know, a long time ago, facilities engineers woke up to the fact that it wasn't a particularly good use of time or resource to hardwire the output of a piece of equipment straight onto the patch panel and the input to the piece of equipment straight onto the patch panel as well. So we came up with this idea of crones. And in fact, crone blocks are kind of the second stab at this kind of wiring system. There was an earlier system which engineers refer to as Christmas trees or, or sol Ooh, okay. solder tag blocks. You don't see them anymore, thankfully. Well, very occasionally when you're decommissioning God. the process. But, um, Having to solder onto those with a 92-watt soldering iron and burnt fingers. Yeah, oh. no, no engineer or wireman enjoys remembering uh, Christmas trees. Uh, and and when, when the crone system was introduced in the late 80s, um, it was a revelation. It's, and it's, it's derived very much from sort of how telephones are, 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 are jumpered up in, in, yeah. in phone exchanges. But you can see here, we've got a frame that's got a bunch of these crone blocks on it. And each crone block, the top of the crone block, is connected to either a piece of equipment or a position on a patch panel. And then you have these, these uh, jumper wires, which go between the various positions on the crone block and the other things that want to be connected to. So, so you might say, well, when we built the facility, we wanted patch panel number one. All the sources are either top of the jack field. We wanted sources one through 24 to be connected to VTs one through six, and all those VTs have got four outputs. And so if you, if you look along the paper label strip on the top of the patch panel, it might say VTR one, output one, VTR one, output two, and then at the other end, VTR six, output three, VTR six, output four. And we did that by wiring all the patch panels back to our chrome frame, by wiring all the VTRs back to our chrome frame, and then by running jumper wire between the chrome blocks. And that sounds, I mean, that sounds like a very kind of fussy, very kind of, uh, you know, um, round the houses way of doing something. 
but actually it, it builds your facility that's very flexible it allows you to move things around on your patch panel without having to get a soldier iron out and it means that uh, your, your jack fields then become a resource which with a little bit of effort can be reused for other things now i've just yeah. i've just stuck up a uh what we call a chrome jumper sheet um which um you know is the kind of thing i would generate and hand to my wireman after the facility's been wired and and he'd get out his his punch down tool his chrome tool which uh, there's one there and he'd, he'd wander over to the chrome frame with a big long roll of, of jumper wire and he'd start doing what the jumper sheet told him so you can see here on the jumper sheet we've got a from and a two jumper so that would go from crone b11 which you know if we look at our if, if we look we at our one, yeah. you know it's it's column b so that might be column b there and uh, that's block number one and block number one in the case of this style of crone frame has got six circuits on each block there's another system that uses 10 circuits on each block and and so by working this working his way down the jumper sheet um, he will have produced the Jackfield layout that I desired when I designed the facility. And in fact, I normally on my jumper sheets for the engineer's benefit when they're subsequently, um, you know, either fault finding or deciding how they might want to rearrange their Jackfields. I stick, um, so, so I've got my source, my from and to jumper reference. So from Chrome B one stroke one to Chrome D one stroke one. And then I put the Jackfield and equipment reference. So yeah. Chrome B one stroke one is audio Jackfield one, source one. So the top most left hand most hole on the jack field and in this installation it goes to avid one output one so if we then went and looked at the jack field after it had been labeled we would see that um source one on the jack field uh would have out avid output one on it <coughs> and by working our way through all the jack fields um We'd, um, we'd, we'd built up a, a, a well-configured facility where we had things in sensible places on Jackfields and by exploiting a little, a little feature that Jackfields have called normaling, we could even have things going to all the places they should be going without even having to get a patch cord out to patch them up. Yeah. And everybody who uses, oh, I don't know about everybody these days, but anybody who used to plug their headphones into um, something and the speaker would stop working, but the sound would come out of the headphones, has been uh, treated to using normaling in that the sound is routed through the the uh, uh, the connector to the loudspeaker. But when you put your headphones in, it breaks that circuit. And this is it's no more complicated than that. It's exactly the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's called a brake jack. So the, it's the, a brake jack. the act of inserting the connector disconnects. <coughs> The existing uh, signal flow through the connector and allows the signal to flow somewhere else. So, in the case of of analog jack fields, our style of normaling is that. So, can, can you lift up your um, the, the, the jack field you had there, Hugh? Because we could, we could see the normaling wires. So, so there's Hugh's jack field. The top, <coughs> the top strip of holes on on the jack field is what's called the source uh, row, which always carry you know, by convention carries the output of equipment. The bottom uh, strip of so, so sound comes out of here. Out of here and goes it goes in the bottom into there. Yeah, so so by like a waterfall, like a waterfall. Imagine water squirts out of here and goes into there. Um, but and by definition or by convention, by commonly accepted convention, the bottom part of the jack field is the inputs to equipment. So you'd think to yourself, okay, I just have to get a load of patch cords. I need to patch those outputs to those inputs. But because spin, spin the jack field around you, so we can see what goes between. If you look very carefully, you can see there are there are little jumper wires running between the source and destination rows of the jack field. And what they're doing is they are carrying the signal from what's coming in on the source jack to the destination jack when there's nothing plugged in to the uh, to the two jacks, the source and destination jacks. Uh, and, and that's very convenient because it means that you could have the outputs of an Avid normaled to the speakers in the Avid suite without having to use patch cords. There's occasions when you might want to have the outputs of the VTR going to those speakers because the director's decided he wants to check the playback. Uh, and in which case, you'd be able to push in jacks on the bottom destination strip and, and have a different signal source going to those destinations. But um, normaling allows you to do that. And in the case of analog jack fields, we, we use a style called half normaling. So the signal comes into the top jacks and is just looped down to the bottom jacks. So the signal is always present on the top jacks. But it's only present on the bottom jacks if you haven't inserted ah. a, a, a patch cord into the bottom row of the jack fields. And that's sensible because you never want to send two signals to one place. You'd never want to send a mix of the Avid and the VTR to the speakers. That would be just mad. Um, but you quite often want to have the Avid going to the speakers in the room and then the Avid being tapped off to a VTR to make a recording. That's very sensible. 
Um, so that's how analog jack fields are configured. That's the half normal system. So you've got a break jack on the bottom and a non break jack on the top. <coughs> when we get to digital audio, uh, we prefer to wire our jack fields fully normaled so that pushing a jack field cork in at the top of the jack field breaks the signal flow and pushing one in at the bottom breaks the signal flow as well. Because uh, AES EBU digital audio signal should never be doubly terminated. You should never really send uh, a digital signal to two places at once. Uh, and that's just the nature of digital signals. They're, they're clocked and they're, and they're fussy about level and, and all those kind of things. Um, but analog, good old analog signals can be terminated multiple multiple times and the signal level doesn't change. And, and it's very convenient to, to be able to have a half normal jack field where you only break the signal flow on the bottom. But in the case of a digital jack field, you have to break the signal flow top and bottom. Um, yeah. So that's a very very common uh, you know convention used in facilities. Makes perfect sense there. So I've just um, go on. I've just popped up the uh, the jumper sheet again, and and the thing that that uh, that you can tell from this is that so the the top part of the jumper sheet is showing us what chrome blocks are connected to audio jack field one source row, uh, and and where they're jumpered to. So so of course those those. B Chrome references run sequentially, as does the Jackfield references run sequentially. But the the two uh, end of the jumper doesn't particularly run sequentially because you know we've got Avid one outputs one and two, Avid two outputs one and two, Avid three outputs one and two, and so they're jumping around a little bit on the Chrome frame. Uh, yeah. But if we look at the the destinations of the uh, the Jackfield, i.e. the bottom row of the Jackfield, we can see that what have we got on the bottom row? So we've got we've got Avid 1 outputs 1, Avid 1 output 2 as the first two sources on the jack field. We've got Suite 1 monitor left and Suite 1 monitor right on the bottom of the jack field. And so that kind of makes eminent sense, doesn't it? Most of the yeah. time, Avid 1's workstation is being used into Suite 1. Uh, and and so that's that's why I lay, laid out this these these jack fields that way. So, so without having to put the patch corks in, the, the, the little cables, you know, you know that there's a, a normal signal going to the edit suite, taking the output of the Avid. Um, yep. and, and so I've also just popped up now uh, what, what the wireman first to was the Chrome Frame map, which, you know, if we, if we go back to the photo of the Chrome Frame, you can see those, those big columns of Chrome blocks, uh, you know, which might be sort of 80 tall. And, you know, in a big facility, there might be, you know, 10 columns oh, yeah. of Chrome <coughs> I mean, you don't see so much nowadays because analog audio is kind of going the way of the dodo. But, uh, but, but, uh, so I've, I've, I've stuck up a, um, a bit of a Chrome map, which kind of shows how a Chrome frame might be laid out. And so, in the case of this Chrome map, we've got the digital audio jack fields on column A, we've got the analog audio jack fields on column B, and then column C is the VTRs, and column D is the AVIDs. Uh, and and uh, yeah, you, you sort of lay out your map in a sensible way like that, so that when you do your jumper sheets. Things are kind of grouped nicely and, and such like. So, yeah. that's just a, a little sort of a little sort of hint about how how uh, audio jack fields, audio chrome frames, those kind of things are set out. And in fact, um, I don't know if 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 people would like to talk about that in more depth. Then uh, I think that could be a subject for another little podcast, uh, which is talking about uh, the philosophies behind laying out patch fields. Um, because it, it, it is actually something which needs a, a little bit of brain scratching uh, sometimes. So it uh, might be a subject that I throw it out there for people if they want to uh, give us a comment and say uh, when they when they pick up our, our podcasts, um, they, they're very welcome to, to contribute uh, comments and contribute to the podcast one day. Uh, we, we, we do want to get some guests on. Um, but uh, yes, talking about those sort of things. So that, well, that, that could be useful. Well, one of my sort of industry mentors, good good friend Chris Clegg, who who I I pretty much learned everything about system design from, um, his his sort of uh, little sort of raison d'être, his little kind of sort of maxim for designing machine rooms is, um, I'd like to design a machine room where, if you had a bunch of freelancers who'd never seen the machine room before, they could competently operate it within half an hour of you taking them into the machine room. So they could competently be assisting edits and doing dubs and, and digitizing material and all that kind of thing within half an hour once you kind of showed them the lay of the land. And, yeah. and that, I, for me, that's the kind of mark of a good machine room. That's a machine room where things are intuitive. There's no kind of strange, unusual things where, oh, yeah, we put that there for these reasons, blah, 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 you, you know. Uh, and yeah. that's what I've always kind of tried to aspire to when, when designing machine rooms, designing you know, patch field layouts, Equipment rack layouts, all those kind of things. Does it is it intuitive? And ideally, with with all the corks pulled out, the system should work normally and as expected. Yes. Um, 
we've been talking happily about these things, but uh, um, I think now's a good time probably to just mention balanced and unbalanced audio. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, so I showed this little uh, gadget before. This is a, this is a, a Sonifex um, a balancing box. And it's, this is this is a, a, a duplex balancing box, in and out, two channels. And, and you say, well, well, so what's that all about? So, you know, you're familiar with the fact that, that, that your DVD player or your CD player, um, left and right channel, has a uh, uh, an RCA phono, phono type connector, which um, carries the, the, the audio signal, you know, uh, the two wires carries an audio signal, and in the case of your your little Walkman stereo headphones, your MP3 stereo headphones, three conductors is enough to carry a stereo signal. You know, there's a left and a right and a common. Uh, but in the case of our our broadcast sort of installations, um, we use these XLR connectors and and the B gauge jacks that, that we've talked about, and they just carry mono signals, which kind of seems very strange. You know, why do you need three conductors? Why do you need three metallic conductors to carry a single mono signal when you know that you can carry a stereo signal over three conductors? And the reason we do that is that, with, with the case of the XLR, what we're sending over the XLR cable is we send two copies of the signal, the electrical signal. We send a live, a, a, a line and a neutral, a, 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 the, the L and the R in the XLR, um, hot and a cold, you know, Wyman often refer to it as, uh, as well as a, an earth common return. And, and the reason we do that is this, this uh, phenomenon called common mode rejection, uh, which is a fantastic uh, sort of thing that, that people have, you know, it's applied to all signal types. You can have balanced signals of any type, data signals as well as audio signals. You can even have balanced video if you wanted to. Um, but a balanced signal, basically, you you take the signal, which is unbalanced by its very nature, you know, the, the signal that comes out of, of a piece of equipment, you know, on, a, on an RCA jack. You take that and you feed it into a, what they call a rep coil or an audio balancing transformer. And... Uh, the whole of the signal is developed across the audio, the, 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 the windings of that transformer, and you have a center tap on the transformer, which is the earth. And, and now you've got a signal which, when the li live portion of the signal is going positive, the neutral portion of the signal is going negative. Uh, and when the, 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 the line portion is going negative, the, the other conductor is going positive. <coughs> so you've just so got, you've if, got you, if, if, you, if, you, if you start with um, ground and a single conductor, um, take ground as your measurement point, uh, a sound is getting a little bit louder. So at an instant in time, the signal will be going up on this conductor. Put it through your magic box, your your um, your, your transformer or your uh, electronic balancing device. Now you've got Earth uh, and you've got two conductors. At any instant compared with Earth, let's say this one's going up, but this one will be going down by the same amount. Uh, yeah. And if you mix the two together, there'll be silence. Yeah, is that right? That, that's exactly right, and and, and, and there's the trick. Um, so so you say to yourself, well, I want to send this signal fifty meters between this machine room and that edit suite, or, or you know this studio and, and, and that recording bay, uh, and but I know that that long piece of wire, that fifty meter piece of wire, part of its characteristic is that it behaves like an antenna, and it picks up mains hum from the air, it picks up radio one and everything else, all the other junk, all the other electrical noise that's in the air. And it might pass over some other cables, and it probably picks up a bit of signal from those as well. Um, and by the time it gets to the other end, it's very noisy, and you know that, that's no way to build a facility. You can't you can't have fifty meter cables that just pick up all the noise that's in the air. So, if you have a balanced line where one conductor's instantaneously going positive, one conductor is instantaneously going negative, i.e., one conductor is the negative, the inverted version of the other. When it gets to the other end, you can feed those two signals into a rep coil which because you've got the earth tap at the center adds them together having inverted one of them first and so now you get a signal which is unbalanced but it's twice as big as what was coming down the line but the upshot of this is because the noise is induced because it's, it's a twisted pair cable the cable the, 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 the pair is very tightly held together twisted twisted twist twist twisted twist, twist yeah. yes um, the, the the noise that's induced on the on the on the positive leg and the noise that's induced on the on the return leg is equally in intensity. But when you get to the other end and you invert one of those legs and add them together, you get double the height signal. But your noise now has been cancelled out, and that that, yes, that, that that phenomenon is called common mode rejection, uh, and that's how balanced signals work. And it means you can effectively send signals long long distances that through noisy facilities, 
and recover a clean signal at the end of the line. Yes, because that which is the same on both conductors uh, is wrong because that's been induced. Um, and that which is different on the conductors was what you meant to send. So they were the different signals are coming down. I can't do it with my fingers, but there we are. That's the that's the difference. And anything that's going like that, well, that must be an error. So, um, and, and so, so this... but also, uh, that also explains why when you showed your picture of the chrome blocks, you only had two colours, red and green. Um, so to the colour blind, one of those is red and one of those is green. Um, but in a chrome block, you only have two colours. Well, so... ac actually, what we're looking at here is an ABS chrome frame, which for each circuit, you get the, the, the hot, cold and screen. And, you know, in a, mixed in, in a facility where you've got mixed digital, analogue and other, other audio type signals like time code, you do well to carry discrete screens through the chrome frame. However... In a facility where you only had analog audio, you quite often see 10 pair blocks which just carry the hot and the cold. And the earth is a common earth between many circuits on the chrome frame. And so every, typically every fifth or every tenth block will be a red earthing block which carries all, the, all that equipment's earth. And that makes sense because all the equipment's bolted into the same cabinets. It's all got a common chassis earth. And in all likelihood, because it's class one equipment, go back to the mains podcast and find out what that means. <laughs> because it's class one equipment, the signal earths will all be common as well. So in a facility where you're not so worried about um, breakthrough because you've got mixed digital, analog and time code type signals, uh, th th then, then 10 pair blocks with uh, um, you, you know, uh, an earth only every now and then is fine. But we tend to do a lot of facilities using ABS blocks where you're taking the earth through the crone as well as the two signal cables as well. So you would have the hot, cold and earth, hot, cold earth, hot, cold earth, hot, cold earth. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, so we've talked about the, the, the uh, common mode rejection. We've talked about having three connectors to carry a single mono signal. Now we know why that's the case. And we've talked, at least in passing anyway, about different types of connectors. Um, but I, just knowing that you can take two connectors, add them together, and you've lost your signal, I think this is a good point to start talking about audio phase. Do you not? Absolutely, absolutely. So, so consider, consider um, uh, a cameraman uh, shooting a, uh, a presenter doing a piece to camera. The presenter might have a, a little... Uh, Lavelier mic on his jacket or on, on her jacket and the cameraman may well have uh, a, a microphone on the top of his camera so so the microphone on the top of the camera is picking up a similar kind of signal to the little clip mic on the on, on the person's uh, shirt uh, but what would happen if the camera was just a far enough distance away from the presenter such that at their average vocal frequencies it was about half a wavelength of audio, which it turns out with round about, you know, kind of 500 hertz to a kilohertz, that's only sort of three or four meters. The kind of typical distances cameramen stand from talent who are doing a piece to camera. So so you've recorded, so the cameraman might record um, channel one, the Lavelier, channel two, his camera mic, and then he knows that the editor can kind of get a mix. He's got some Atmos, you know, for the room or for the street that they were doing the recording in, and he's got the, the little Lavelier mic. Now, consider now that those two signals are exactly half a waveform apart. Um, when they get mixed in the Avid, uh, you might find that you're cancelling out one with the other. You might find that they're just antiphase to each other so that one cancels the other out and that happens um, and uh, you quite often find editors having to slip one of those audio tracks by just a few milliseconds to get them so they're totally you know unrelated to each other uh, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of, of some of the problems where two signals might be entirely out of phase with each other so 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 we've said about that so consider a stereo pair um, going through a facility and uh, at some point, because of a wiring error or some other problem, a dodgy cable or something like that, the live and the neutral on one of those signals becomes switched around. Now, if you plug that signal into a loudspeaker, you'll be able to hear the difference. You know, a phase reverse signal sounds exactly the same as a normal signal. And to be honest, there's no fundamental difference between them because sound is constantly varying. You know, there's, you know, 
the electrons, there's as many electrons going one way as going the other. Or in the case of a loudspeaker, there's as many molecules of air being pushed one way as being pulled back by the speaker cone as it pulls back. Uh, which makes nonsense of the fact that you can buy speaker cable that's directional, that's got arrows on it, you know. But, you know, a full, an audio file and his money are soon parted. Um, but, uh, but, 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 especially one over 40. <laughs> But consider those two signals. That they might be the same thing, uh, or they might be just a stereo pair, so that they're almost the same thing. There's not much difference between them. Uh, one's now out of phase with the other. It's had its live and neutral reversed. It's line and, and light, hot and cold switched around. If they ever should get mixed again in the future, they will effectively cancel each other out. Uh, those signals are said to be out of phase with each other. And, uh, you know, should you mix them inadvertently... Or should they be transmitted in that state and they get mixed in a mono television set in somebody's kitchen, uh, you'll almost entirely lose the audio. The only thing you'll hear will be the differences between the two channels. And that you occasionally, very occasionally hear that on air. You know, an out-of-face signal has made it to air and, um, you know, all you hear is the kind of bits of the music that were quite wide or, or the kind of bits of the audience that weren't captured by both microphones entirely. Uh, and so phase is a very serious problem, and, and in fact, I've got a, I've got a uh, the Tektronix uh, rasterizer display up at the moment, and that shows phase between all the different channel pairs because this is a this is a five one multi channel arrangement. But if I just grab hold of my my little PPM meter that we were monkeying about with earlier, you can see as well as the two peak LEDs, so peak for channel one and peak for channel two, we've got a phase LED between the two channels, and most of the time that that blinks on green because it's showing that there's not very much difference between the two channels. But should you ever see that LED come on red, it means there's a lot of difference between the two channels and you're in danger of having an out-of-phase signal and you've got to do something about it. And in fact, on, on even modestly sized analog audio mixers, there's often a phase reverse button at the top of a channel. So if you, yeah. you realise you've got a phase reversed pair coming in uh, and uh, this is going to be problematic further down the line, particularly when you mono that signal and listen to it off out of a single speaker, you can, you can press the phase reverse button at the head of the channel, the top of the channel of the mixer, and that will phase reverse that channel, hence correcting the phase error between those two channels. Uh, we used occasionally to have, um, hanging around in the machine rooms, uh, a phase reverse patch lead, uh, typically yellow, I think yellow, it was. Yep. But uh, uh, you certainly didn't want that to be in common use and you needed everybody to know. But it could get you out of a sticky situation sometimes, just pop that in and reverse the phase. So. Yeah, no, it, yes. it, it happens, doesn't it? I've worked on productions where, uh, where, where and you, you don't notice it in the truck or, or in the studio because you're listening to a stereo feed. And very experienced audio guys, you sometimes see them moving their heads like this between the speakers. And they're trying to find that sort of dead zone where, where the sound is mixing in the air and cancelling itself out. And ex yes. ex experienced audio guys can hear out of phase sound as they're sitting behind their mixing desk. Uh, it, it's a peculiar sensation, actually. It sounds as if the sound is slight, o o outside of the two speakers rather than inside it. It's a most peculiar sensation, um, and you, you can hear it. But uh, uh, we were talking about, um, and since we've got phase on the mind, uh, we were talking about test tones. If you're in a mixing situation, uh, imagine you've been called into a, a studio and they've got test tone up. As you walk across the studio, you'll hear knolls. Um, I don't know if you've come across it. Yeah. I certainly have myself. It's not a great way to test uh, a studio setup. Don't put the tone up and then walk about expecting it to be at a nice even level because it won't be. Mm. You've got some very strange effects. That, that, that's right, particularly as, as audio bounces off the back wall and bounces off the side yeah. walls and, and meets itself coming back and you know, it reinforces itself or destroys itself. And, and it's, it's, it's why, you know... Uh, Acousticians, um, you know, strive for, for, for minimising reflections within audio rooms. It's why the kind of the windows are at funny angles, and and why the the walls have got you know sort of alternating layers of, of rock wool and, and MDF and you know plasterboard to try and to try and get them to be as dead as possible, so that they're not bouncing signals around to interfere with themselves. Um, so I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject all of its own. And I mean, maybe we can maybe we can bag an acoustician and, uh, and and get to. I think that'd be a great idea. Yes. Um, but a very specialist area. Indeed it is. Well, I think we've got, we've had a really good overview there uh, of audio. There's a lot more that could be gone into in any one of these um, uh, sort of little channels of it. But getting the levels right, 
being aware of the uh, the phases, making sure you've got the right connectors, and that little tip on XLR um, is brilliant. <laughs> it's, it's sort of thing I wish I'd learned a long time ago. It would have saved me a lot of bother. Um, but typically, uh, the, the, the probably one of the biggest sources of a phase error is getting uh, those two pins the wrong way around when you're wiring an XLR. Whether you intended to do it or, or not, um, that's possibly one of the biggest sources of, uh, of problems. So... The, the, a good place to check. There's a little kind of fun thing, a bit related to phase, which which audio engineers in the 60s and 70s used to do. And you, you've you've no doubt seen uh, uh, you know concerts where where the singer will have two microphones gaffer taped together. Uh, yeah. And uh, and I always just think to myself, why on earth did they do that? Why don't they just like get better microphones or something? I don't know. Uh, but it's because uh, the singer sings into one microphone and doesn't really sing much into the other one, but both microphones. Are picking up the stage noise, the feedback, the the, the the induced nonsense, yeah. And so the recording engineer will phase reverse one of those feeds, and add it into the add it into the vocal mic. So so he's in effect cancelling out all the stage noise and and feedback as it starts to build and, and all that kind of stuff. And he's just getting the singer's vocal performance. That's why. Um, you know, you look at kind of uh, I've, I've popped up a picture of uh, Leonard Skinner, uh, Ronnie Van Zant. Uh, performing with with two two uh, mics taped together, uh, it's, it's, it's why they used to do that. Um, in the in the uh, things have got a lot better nowadays because you know vocal mics typically will each mic will have a compressor and and uh, you know things are much PA systems are much better. But that was a trick that they used to use, you know, thirty forty years ago, uh, to, uh, and they'd exploit phase reversal in that situation. A bit like the balanced line using common mode rejection to get rid of noise on the line. They, 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 yeah. That's kind of noise that's in the air, you know, so it's the same principle, but but taken to that very kind of earthy degree of, of you know, kind of 1960s, 1970s rock singers on stage. Yeah, excellent. Well, that takes us to the end, I think, of, of our introduction to audio. Uh, if anybody wants to um, ask us to to go into more depth in, in something i'm sure we would be delighted to do so i'd love to get an acoustician to give us an overview on um on making a sound treatment as opposed to sound proofing um and perhaps to explain those so that could be a topic of another discussion but we'd need to get somebody else to come and help us with that but it'd be a really interesting one um so there now phil we do these podcasts. How can people actually get to hear them? Okay, or well, see them? I'm, I'm just I'm just flicking through on my screen the, the, the various ways you can find it. So so it's on iTunes, of course. Um, uh, you know where all good podcasts live. Uh, you can find it on iTunes if you if you search iTunes for the Engineers Bench. That's what the little name we gave it. Um, uh, YouTube, uh, it's a channel on YouTube. If you search for Phil Crawley's channel, uh, uh, that you'll 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 find it there. And I'll I'll put lower thirds up with these. I've also just uh, I'm popping up uh, yours and yours and mine's website so that people can find us as well and our Twitter okay. handles. And in fact, um, because it's available through iTunes, you can even watch the podcast on your iPad or uh. or uh, <laughs> you know other 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 fine tablet computers are available. <laughs> <laughs> Superb. There we are. And uh, if you've got any comments, please do um, do contact us by one of those means. So there we are. Jolly good. Thank you very much, Hugh. And uh, uh, next time, we're, uh, we're 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 still we're still toying with with the idea of rapid development um, platforms like the Raspberry Pi and Netium and things like that. I haven't yet got my Raspberry Pi, but I hope I will for Ooh, next time. It's coming soon, I should think. Yes, Indeed, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Well, terrific. I've had. A string of visitors we've had uh, i understand that my sister's been on the telephone that supper's been ready for god knows how long the boy needs to be played with so <laughs> 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 live who'd have it right jolly good i will see you soon chap yeah look forward to it all right Catch bye, you later. bye